Ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you please take your seats at this time as the program will begin momentarily. Welcome to today's Rapide Talk show on peer assessment. Today we have several guests who all have experience with peer assessment in education and an expert to explain the finer points. There will also be an opportunity for you to ask questions to our guests and the expert. Ever wondered how to teach students to critique a peer's work when they didn't see anything to critique or to teach them how they can constructively critique a peer's work that is under par? Well, today, you will get to hear about that and more. We will be recording this event and the link will be shared in the course later. We may release the recording in other places, but we will keep your input anonymous. To interact with our guests and expert today, you will be using Slido. Go to slido.com and enter the code or scan the QR code on your screen. You may enter any question you have or vote up or down any questions from others you, that you would like to see answered during the show. Let me introduce today's expert on peer assessment. Gillian Saunders-Smiths will explain peer assessment and why it is a useful tool. She is an expert in engineering education research and has been teaching ed engineering for more than 20 years. Gillian, thanks for being with us here today. Can you start us off on what is peer assessment and why is it useful? Hi, Naomi. Thank you very much for having me here today. Peer assessment is best defined as the process in which students assess the products or outcomes of learning of each other, their peers, so to speak. The products or outcomes of learning can be anything from assignments to designs, from written products to an individual's effort and contribution with the context of a group project. It's a great way to provide students with formative or even summative continuous assessments, whilst at the same time not overloading the lecture. Thanks for explaining that, Jillian. Um, that was really helpful and um, that gets us started on understanding the topic today. Let's move on to our first guest, John Allen Pasco. John Allen is an assistant professor from aerospace engineering. Don't forget though, if you have any questions for Jillian or our guests, please submit them via Slido. John Allen, can you tell us how you use peer assessments in your teaching? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my main experience with peer assessments has been in the design synth synthesis exercise, which is a 10 week group project at aerospace engineering at the end of the bachelors. And there we use peer assessment to gain insight into the group dynamics and uh, make sure we can grade everyone individually fairly. That sounds like a very great plan with the group dynamics and unfair grading for sure. Um, you use peer assessment as a prescribed part of the course. Why is using peer assessment useful for you in the course? Yeah, so as I said, it's a full-time course. So the students are ready for 10 weeks only working on that. And in that time, as supervisors, we have to form a picture of what they're doing. And eventually we have to grade all of the students individually, even though they're mainly producing uh, outcomes as a group, right? So there's a group report, a group design. Uh, and so you need to get insight into how much did everyone contributes. Mm. And yeah, we, we have these group reports where they individually mark who did what. Uh, and apart from that, we see them maybe once a week and then you drop by a couple of times just to see how they're doing. So it can be difficult to, to really form a picture of uh, did everybody put in uh, all the effort they should? Is it maybe someone who was quietly working in the background and you didn't see it reflected in the reports? Uh, or are there tensions or, or you know, conflicts in the group that you're missing out on? Uh, so we use the peer assessment as an additional piece of information we can use to try and signal is the read that we have as supervisors on the group, does that match with how the group themselves feel about it? That sounds like very useful. Um, do you think your students uh, find peer, peer assessments uh, useful? I can see it from the instructor side. Definitely, yeah. So I, I think very much so, right? Because it, it really gives them a way to, to signal to us as instructors uh, and say, you know, I think all of us who've done a, a group project know the frustration if someone in the group wasn't pulling their weight and, and then they still get a high mark. Uh, or, or, you know, or maybe if you were overlooked because the people in the group that you know, maybe are louder uh, were better able to, to show to the teachers what they were doing. Uh, so I think peer assessment gives the students a way to kind of uh, address those issues. That makes sense. Um, so how do you create a safe place or space for feedback? Yeah. Uh, so I think what is helpful in, in this context is, uh, first of all, the way the assessment is collected. So the students get a rubric where they score each other, uh, and then there's the possibility to give comments. 
And the students can choose either those comments are visible to everyone, completely open, and therefore also to their peers, or the comments can be restricted to only the supervisory team. Uh, so then the students know uh, that those comments are confidential, and we also reinforce that. We say at the beginning of the course to the students, you know, everything you write down there, we will treat as confidential. We're not going to share it with anyone. Uh, so that helps on the one side. The students are hopefully feel more free to express it if they're having issues. Uh, and on the other side, uh, the peer assessment is not directly linked to the grading. Uh, so we also tell students, like, look, it's just a piece of information we use in the overall grading uh, that we assign. Uh, so, you know, if someone does write down on the, the peer assessment, gives you a low score or writes down a piece of feedback that you're not happy about, you don't have to worry that that's immediately going to pull down your grade. We're going to use that to investigate and, and form our own opinion of what's going on. Uh, so I guess that also makes students feel a bit more safe because they know, you know, if someone, for whatever reason, the group doesn't like them and gives them a low grade on something, it's not immediately going to affect the grade. Yeah, that sounds like really good plans. Um, so thanks, John Allen. Please stay with us a little bit longer uh, while we see if the audience has submitted any questions via Slido here. Um, we're going to look at the slide here and see if we have any incoming questions. We do. All right. So our first question to you today is, what would be your top tip for a lecturer wanting to use peer assessment in group work? Yeah, um, I think my top tip will be, you have to take into account that there's a lot of social dynamics at play as well, right? You, and there's a very different relationship. If you're just a teacher, especially for a large class where you're going to have the students once and maybe three years later, if they, they pick the right master again, there's a very different dynamic when you're grading the work than students who could be each other's roommates or be on the same football team or taking yeah. five other classes together at the same time. You might have a group where there's some romantic relationships even, I don't know. Uh, all of that plays a role and, and I think will play in students' minds when they're assessing. Right, it's, it's a bit different to give a stranger to fill them than to fill your roommate, right? So I think really, when you're designing the peer assessment, also think about how are you going to deal with those group dynamics and have something in place to yeah, prevent that from getting in the way of the assessment. That makes sense. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, Jillian, do you have any input as well um, based on what you said so far? I think that a lot of what John Allen says is, is what we talk about when we talk about the safe and inclusive um, assessment environment. It's very important for students to feel safe, that the lecturers understand that there is more at play than just simple uh, something's right, something's wrong, uh, that the input from students uh, has to be seen within the context of the group dynamics and that group dynamics differ per group. And that's why it's important that you get to um, uh, uh, that you also listen to the group. And, and in that sense, I, I really uh, appreciate John Allen's comments that he said, if something gets signaled that's wrong, it's very, very important that you don't say, oh, that means minus five points in your, of your grade. No, it's it's your, your um, signal as a lecturer to start investigating on whether there might be other things going on or whether this is right or whether there's a jealousy. There could be all sorts of group dynamics. It, it's sort of your... Yeah, I always see it as a little bit as my gossip column, but it gives me a better idea of what's going on in a group. And then I can look into and see if that matches my own image of a group. And also if there's other issues that I've missed, because that happens. Um, students also uh, still think we're the, uh, yeah, we're the other side. I won't say as far as the enemy, the other side, definitely. Well, thanks for the input. So can, I, can I just uh, ask the audience? Um, this is an interactive talk show. So please, people, we only have one question. You can do better than that. <laughs> we are looking forward to the questions, but we also understand it might take a little bit to type those questions. So we can also come back later too, if there are um, more questions to you and you will have the opportunity to post it in the course um, later on as well. But we do definitely welcome the questions now, if you can, while John is with us here. Um, so we can give it like one more second. Here. Yeah, I can maybe also add just an example to, to missing things. Um, on the, on the positive side, right, focused on negative, you might miss uh, conflicts and things like that. But uh, actually, in the last project we had, there was uh, one student who just reading through the report, I thought, well, the contribution is a bit lacking. But then because of the comments from the peer reviewer, I could say, ah, actually, the student worked on all kinds of things in the background mm -hmm. to help the group out and to, to really positively influence the outcome, uh, which we would have missed just talking with the report. And that way, we could actually raise the grades we otherwise would have given. I have wondered about that in the past, too, because I'm sure we've all been in group dynamics where the person silent in the final paper 
was maybe the one that talked the most in a quiet, intimate place where they were in a small group. They gave all of the ideas and the group used the ideas um, and kind of ran with it. But maybe that person didn't feel like being so outgoing in that final paper or presentation or whatever the final product was. So that is seems to be a good way to kind of bring that out from that one person's input. Yeah. When you do then have to get the group to the stage where they are going to give that credit where it's due. Yeah. That's, yeah. That also would be helpful too. All right, I don't see any other questions, but if we do have another question, we'll um, come back to you. Uh, so John Allen, thank you again for being here today. And John Allen will now be leaving us um, because we do have a couple other guests coming in. So in the meantime, please do keep those questions coming via Slido. And uh, we will be welcoming our next guest um, soon here to the show. And her name is Manuk Pande Schwan. She is a master student and teaching assistant at aerospace engineering, which means that she is the perfect person to find out about the, the student's perspective on peer assessment. Manuk, welcome and thank you for wanting to be here and share your experiences from a student perspective. How did experience, uh, how did you do experience peer review in your student design projects? Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I've been a bachelor's student at aerospace engineering. So I've done over those three years, uh, each semester we did a peer assessment. So I've done quite a few. Um, I have experienced that throughout the times that you do it, you um, see more and more why you're doing it. Because initially when I started as a freshman, I saw that it was something that I had to do. It was uh, something you had to fill in about your students. You feel, felt a bit awkward to tell them what they're doing wrong, mm -hmm. those kind of things. And you were thought maybe there will be like a fight or anything. You didn't want to cause any trouble. And later on, I saw it more as an opportunity to actually see what could I improve in group dynamics? Is there something uh, that I might do better um, which I haven't seen myself. Yeah. And it's also really nice to uh, get some praise from your fellow students because that's also what it's for. It's not only negative comments. That's a great point because I kind of see where at first it might feel awkward, but then you kind of gain that um, experience and you do feel more confident in yeah. giving that kind of feedback. So thanks for um, bringing that out. And thanks for sharing uh, your experiences. Um, in your opinion, yeah. as a student and also a teacher assistant, um, and I'll grab my question here. Um, what are the things that lecturers must do to ensure that students see um, peer assessment as a useful tool and take it seriously? Yeah, so for me, uh, as I said, I had the student side and now I've done um, as a teaching assistant multiple projects. So uh, I was there on the other side for once, which was a very interesting way to look at it again, uh, see from a different perspective. And I think what I missed in the beginning and what being, is talked about a bit before is making sure you communicate to the students wh why it is there. It's not there to make sure indeed that they get a bad grade if they didn't do well, but it's there for their personal growth. And I think that's something in university that we not always focus on as much, mm. definitely not in engineering courses, but a project is not only to learn how to design something, I feel like, but also, yeah, to make sure you grow as a person uh, in within project groups. So I think that is really important for uh, lecturers to make sure that you tell them, indeed, it doesn't give you immediately a bad grade, mm. but um, it's also uh, a, a tool for fellow, uh, yeah, the responsible lecturers to see how the group is doing because you're always there for a little while, so you don't know precisely what's happening. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, how do you encounter the feedback you've received from peers? Yeah, so uh, indeed, I had some negative. I have had some stuff uh, indeed, and wasn't always that very constructive. Even though we, of course, everyone tries, but it can come over as a bit negative. Uh, but uh, one, I had. I think I had it twice. I just talked with a fellow student the moment I saw him after it and was like, yeah, I don't want to have a fight, but I'm just curious, where did the comment come from? Um, and I think that's something definitely for me that helped really with uh, the, yeah, being able to handle critique because I had a bit of problems with that when I was younger. And I think I really learned a lot from that. So yeah, um, that was a learning curve for me. 
Yeah, it sounds like that's a experience that most of us probably have to learn is um, gaining that critique, but it likely prepared you as a teaching assistant um, for now. So how do you prepare students to receive feedback from peers? Yeah, so uh, indeed, it really helps me to give uh, my fellow students uh, tips and tricks uh, before they see their first uh, peer review because they've never done something like that before. So it's completely new to them. And I think that uh, I tell them, like, you're not there to start a fight. You're, yeah, try to build it up indeed. But I usually, what was uh, told to me is to use a bit of a sandwich uh, type of criticism. So start with something that you think they do well, try to bring in in the middle some critique of what they might do better and then end up with something positive. Um, and if you don't have um, anything like positive of course you have I'm, I'm I was always like I know it's difficult to find something to write down but try to take some time for it because if every student in your group does it it really helps and if only half of it does it's quite useless as peer review so that is also very important so that's how I try to prepare them make sure to take it seriously because it would be a waste if only half of it I mean have respect for each other to fill it in truthfully yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And thanks for giving such useful um, advice. Um, before we go back to the q and I'm going to pass it over to Jillian. Do you have anything to possibly add? Well, I think Manu kind of the importance of not just telling students, go fill in the peer assessment. That's just not how it works. Um, it does. It, it's part of your teaching and learning activity. So it's part that you uh, also have to give instructions for and explain how you will use it, um, explain very... Uh, elaborately that the system is safe for students. It's quite scary very often to give personal feedback for the first time. And as Mook said, it's generally not something that students are used to doing. So it's very important that you do that. And it's a very important skill. So, I mean, there's more than enough research out there is that uh, you can become a good engineer, a good doctor, a good teacher. But what makes you a great doctor and a great engineer is if you also have those other skills, not just your uh, job specific skills, but also the skills that you need to talk to people, to receive feedback from people, to learn from each other. Um, those are the really important parts. So, so these are the, I would almost say they're added free bonuses that you can put in a course that peer assessments also adds to your course in whichever way you do it. But it's very important that you help students learn this. So at Arrow, they, they've done this really well. They start in year one of the bachelor and the same system is used throughout each design project all the way to year three. So for students, by the end, it's a familiar tool that they're used to doing. And to a certain extent, not that different when they go and work in industry and they have to deal with the 360 degree feedback tools that many uh, industries use um, in their yearly assessments uh, cycles. So in that sense, there's there's lots of, uh, uh, yeah, there's lots of importance in doing it right. Makes a lot of sense. And I think you, like you, you pointed out, giving clear instructions and then later on how the assessment is going to be used is really important for uh, students to know in advance. Uh, let's look again at Slido to see what questions have been submitted from our audience and see what we have for a minute for your questions. And we do have one question. Thank you. Um, what is your top tip for lecturers to tell their students when using peer assessment in courses? Yeah, so we've talked about it a bit, but uh, I think indeed my top tip is um, I think something that Gillian said too, uh, it will be used later on in your career as well. It's something for personal growth, something to uh, learn from and don't see it as something that you must do and be sure to communicate always very well uh, why you're doing it. So students know what you're doing and not see it as a must, but as an opportunity. That sounds like really good advice as well. And since we don't have a question other than that, I do have a question for you. Um, something that I've um, done more on like just general customer service kind of response, because what I notice, especially in this type of setting, um, when you're receiving critique, sometimes you get like a, an emotional attachment, especially if someone's critiquing your work. So yeah. one of the things that I've said to students, but I've also said to um, anyone that's uh, worked with me as well is, when you get like an email, because it's in an online setting usually, no. um, if you have a negative reaction or you feel something emotional about it, usually don't respond, don't react, <laughs> wait a day, 
ask other people what their perspective of how you read it and then come back and say, you know, this is my response and this is what I think. But also I realize sometimes before hitting the reaction button, it's also nice to just ask, I have these questions about how, like what your response was, you know, so you can clarify right away. Is that what their meaning was and things like that? Like, do you give advice like this or do you see that kind of misunderstandings come up much in these fear? Pure online settings. Um, it is an online. Pure yeah. Assessment. So it is. It's always been online, but now with COVID restrictions over the last few years, uh, it has really increased. Indeed, these type of situations. Uh, what usually happens is the same time the students get their personal results, I, uh, as a teaching assistant, get them the overview. And uh, in some of the tools, there's also a bit of scoring, like there might be a problem with these and these students. It tries to analyze it. So that is a great tool to already like jump ahead of it and try to discuss with both of them. Like, how do you feel about, do you want to have a quick call about your peer review before I put them together? Indeed, try to be the person in the middle to calm them down. Indeed, yeah. because I've had a situation where one student came in quite angry um, and one said, I need to talk to you. And I'm, I saw it immediately at the start of the session. I was like, okay, I'm going to stay there and I'm going to talk. I'm going to stay there within the room. Um, and if you want to, and then eventually I decided to first talk to the person that was angry alone. Like, do you want to be that angry to that person? Yeah. So yeah, indeed, as you said, try to weigh the day, calm down a bit. Usually weigh the day helps a lot, but it yeah. can be really personal. Sometimes yeah. it's just, yeah. I mean, students also make mistakes with the way they're wording stuff. Uh, I mean, they're only, uh, I mean, we're only students. Yeah. Um, so it's also a learning moment on how to bring it. But uh, yeah, it's really helpful to uh, be a middleman then. Yeah, I think that makes good sense too. And yeah. I think everyone has a bad day. So kind of reading a critique on a bad day sometimes yeah. doesn't help. And, and definitely when, day, yeah, yeah the, peer, the peer assessment usually comes around the time of exams. So a lot of students yeah, are stressed that and that, yeah, doesn't help as well. Yeah, no, it sounds like some good techniques, uh, especially for students during those times. Um, I, we have another question, I'm sure. We yeah. do. Thank you for alerting us. We have one more question here and that's how to develop the criteria for peer assessment. What is a student's perspective on that? That's a really good um, question. Yeah, I think that is definitely a really good question. Um, what I've seen over the years is that you have different uh, criteria such as attitude, commitment, and stuff like that. And I think what would be uh, ideal is those are pretty good, I think. Uh, because it makes sense for a project. Those are the stuff you're looking for in fellow students. But um, maybe try with like uh, within the faculty, you usually have students, uh, councils and stuff like that. Try to discuss it with those parties. Try to include students when you're trying to make new criteria, because I think it's really helpful if fellow students can say we worked on it. There's a lot more trust from the student's perspective also in it, because yeah. then you don't have really much to us them. And then it's more blended. Yeah, that sounds like a really good um, option here. Uh, Jillian, do you have any points to add to this? Yeah, that's indeed the excellent suggestion. See, the biggest point with assessment is that the criteria have to be access acceptable to the person that is being assessed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, the, the beautiful word that used for this is co-creation. It really pays off to create with students. Now, certain soft, uh, peer assessment software has standard ones because they have been validated and they know that they measure what they say they measure. But you can usually either add extra ones or if you're creating a whole new rubric, in a, maybe not for group work or for other uh, types of peer assessment, then it can be really helpful to also see what students find important. And it often gives lecturers a completely different perspective because they haven't realized that students find different things important than we do. And, and they, they do give you insights that you hadn't thought of. Oh, yeah, that's also important. And students who are always making the deadline would like to be rewarded for making the deadline. They feel really let down that if yeah. we help somebody, even though if there's a really good reason to let somebody, they're like, yeah, but I, I was on time, you know, where is my reward for sticking to this rule? It's, yeah. it's a, it's a thing, especially with, with good students. Like you always favor the, uh, lazy, uh, unlucky student. It, it's something to keep in mind. So how do we make sure that we also appreciate the good students? Um, so those are, it, it's really important to have those. The only downside is when you do it, you have to make sure you have a representative selection of students. 
especially if you have a more international uh, environment, not all internationals feel equally um, uh, able to participate in those things. So that is a, there is always a risk of bias. Mm -hmm. So when you do that, I would definitely recommend that you sort of do a check. Do I have everybody uh, of the whole spectrum, but also the students who failed? Why did they fail? Did they not understand the criteria? Was there... They, they can also give you a useful perspective. So I think that there are many different possibilities, but their co-creation with students, I think, is, 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 is one of the most effective tools that we have as teachers. We don't have to do it alone. So why would we? I think students can also be a, a great uh, pointer to the actual point of what they were learning, because I heard a, a recent webinar not too long ago this last year of um, sometimes we teach them to do this, but we ask them or grade them on doing that. Um, and that mismatch, like students can actually help in that co-creation to make sure. Uh, I thought we were told we had to do this and then they can bring it up. And I think that helps too. So yeah, that's, that's great. That co-creation really does help kind of clarify some of those. Yeah, that's like, like constructive alignment that we talk a lot mm -hmm. about in this course, that your teaching and learning activities have to be aligned with your assessment. If your assessment is something entirely different than you have uh done in your teaching and learning activities, your course is out of alignment. And yeah, you will have unhappy students. And students are a great way, a great indicator of going, huh? 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 why? How? Um, so yeah, use them. Definitely. So thanks, Manuk, for being with us here today. And um, we really appreciate your time. Manuk will now be leaving us because we have one more guest that we want to bring in. Um, we're going to bring back up the slide. And in the meantime, please do keep those questions coming uh, via Slido so we can ask uh, questions to the guests and expert here today. Uh, we will welcome our next guest, Anhanit Kam. Anhanit is a lecturer at the Center for Languages and Academic Skills here at TU Delft. Anhanit has recently experimented with comparative judgment and peer assessment. Anhanit, thanks for being with us. What can you tell us about peer review with rubrics and peer review using Comproved? Yeah, well, I have a lot to tell, so uh, let's see how far we get. Um, yeah, uh, at our Center for Languages and Academic Skills, we mainly teach writing courses, academic writing and presenting courses. And we use uh, peer review uh, mainly in our writing courses, though in the presentation courses, we also ask students to give feedback to one another. And for both situations, we often use rubrics because we have a large team of uh, students, of, of uh, lecturers. Yeah. And then it's, 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 it is a nice tool to make sure that you are using the same criteria in, for every student. But we also find then that in assessing writing, we still need to discuss a lot with one another about, okay, so this paper, does it score uh, mediocre? And, and those are the hard cases, right? Mm -hmm. Where you don't really know whether it is a pass or a fail. Mm -hmm. And then you still need to discuss how to interpret all the criteria on the, on the rubric. Um, and that's hard. That takes a lot of time. Yeah. So recently we started to uh, do an experiment with a new program that's called Comproved. It was developed by Belgian researchers. It has been, there's been a lot of research on it and it makes use of comparative assessment, mm -hmm. which means that the, the program um, presents uh, two different examples of a student uh, work uh, that may be, for example, an introduction for a paper or an abstract that they have written for their uh, research paper. Um, and the only thing that you ask of the people who are doing the peer review is, um, do you like the first one better or the, or the next one? Mm. And then they can give a top and a tip and then move on to the next two examples. So as, an, as a peer reviewer, you get to see many different examples of that one piece of text. Um, and um, as a student, you can even also look at the results afterwards. And if you have a, a large group of assessors, you actually get a nice curve. So as a student, you can see where you score on that curve. Uh, and, okay. and then you can also take a look at, um, and it's all anonymous, ideally, so um, people do not know exactly who submitted what, and you can compare your own work with the work of your fellow students, which really mm -hmm. enhances self-reflective practices. Yeah. yeah, so that is what we, uh, we've been using, and um, it is a new program, so we still need to get used to it. Of course, it also has its issues. 
Um, but it was a nice, uh, nice program to try out at least. Yeah. yeah, it sounds really interesting. The comparison with the peers and the like scoring on the curve. So you kind of know where you're at right. based on others. But I also like the, you, you basically get two examples from the same learner. So if you, you know, got better after getting feedback and you've advanced your writing or whatever the skill that you were aiming for in that, then it seems like you get a second chance of, they can kind of see if you've improved, but they can also see where you're at from the past or something is yeah. that kind of part of what that is mm, well i think not so much okay. because uh, because uh, you know we have very very large cohorts of students yeah uh, and to keep track exactly of how someone improves compared to the uh the earlier edition that a... is sometimes a bit difficult mm. to keep track of that um but the yeah the, the self-reflection that we you hear students uh, students report is, is really well. So for example, when they're engaging in this kind of peer review, I often have students who tell to, or who are engaging in that. And at that moment, when I'm in the classroom with them, they'll ask me over and they, they'll say, okay, so I see that this student is doing this and that in her text. And I didn't do that. So did I do that wrong? Yeah. So it helps them to think about, oh yeah, okay. So maybe this is something that I should change in my own writing. Yeah. And then in the in the comparative assessment, what is very nice of that is that they get a, quite a, an extensive list of tops. So things that they did well with okay. positive um, um, reviews uh, and also tips like what can can I improve? And, and um, because you get it from so many different people who are maybe sensitive for specific criteria more than other people for that criteria, you, you get a, a very nice overview of things that you can improve. Yeah, that yeah. sounds very fascinating. Yeah. It sounds like a wonderful tool to use. So thanks for sharing about that. Um, I did have one question on the tool, which was, um, is it only writing or are there other things like that you can mm. put in there? Is there like video or like, right. blueprints, images? Like, do they get options yeah. on that? Or? Definitely, yeah. Um, you can definitely upload videos okay. uh, and anything that's graphic uh, or that you can put in a PDF format, for example, um, or pieces of code. I mean, um, you can compare almost anything. Yeah, it's really nice. And I do have one other question for mm -hmm. you, and uh, that would be, how do you train students to give constructive feedback? Yeah, that's a very important one because yeah. we sometimes just assume that students know how to do this, right? Yeah. So we actually have some slides in place that we show them um, that deal with, uh, for example, when you're uh, assessing texts, like um, make sure that the person who receives your feedback knows which specific paragraph or which specific sentence you are uh, addressing, right? So where in the text does the problem occur? Also, um, explain what your problem exactly was. Is it a reading problem? Is it something in the content that you didn't understand? Um, so from a reader perspective, what were your problems when you were reading this text? Mm. And then if you can, um, so it's a, it's a three step procedure actually um also explain what you would like to see improved if you can so that someone really has something to work with not only i didn't understand this because then you would know what this is and what kind of understanding was lacking but um uh, in this paragraph there's this one sentence that i really get stuck in um, maybe you can um, uh, re rewrite it by uh, cutting up the sentence or something like that that would be much more helpful because then as yeah. a student, you would know what to what you could do to improve the reader's yeah. um, experience. It's yeah. exactly right. Kind of giving the, what can I improve? Not just like what went wrong. Right. That's yeah. really brilliant to yeah. add in there. <laughs> um, I'm going to switch it over to Jillian to see, do you have anything to add as an expert in this? I think it, what, I, what I really like about Comproved is, and the whole comparative judgment things is that it's an additional tool to our toolbox that we didn't have until recently. Uh, we, we sort of ended up with rubrics being the the, 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 the the last and final answer in terms of giving more qualitative uh, based feedback. And the nice thing about this, because of all the research that has shown that it's also very reliable and that it still helps students uh, judge each other, it's especially good for um, topics that also have a certain form of, um, uh, how do I say, uh, 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 taste it, right? So. Uh, mm. Not everybody prefers the same style of writing. Mm -hmm. Not everybody will appreciate the same type of artwork. Uh, why does one person have a white design, very tightly designed table? And why does somebody else have a wooden carved table? Uh, this, so that is also in there. 
Uh, and by having the, the preferences, you also can eliminate a little bit of that. So that, that's really good. Uh, and the nice thing is you make use of the large quantities. Um, if you ask students to just assess from group to group, they know whose work it is. If with the large numbers that we have in Delft, at least, uh, you can make a very large selection. And even if you ask 20 individual students to look at each project, they may still not know whose it is. So um, you get a much better quality feedback, certainly on, 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 uh, on these little pieces. The downside is, as, as Anthony said, it's not suitable for large pieces of text. Eh? You have to do small parts, but yet, especially in the small part, isn't it? And yeah, I think that I think that was sort of the running theme also almost of today is all this only works if we as lecturers create that safe space, if we instruct mm -hmm. the students, if we al allow them to develop these self-reflections and these constructive feedback skills. Otherwise, uh, yeah, it will be a sort of a, like a, a get even competition or a who is the toughest. That's another one I've mm -hmm. seen before. Uh, and, and the nice thing is, I think when proof is not just for peer assessments, it's also for general assessment. So you can also have multiple lecturers assess. So your overall grading reliability in your assessment, it can also go on. Um, this isn't uh, Angeniet's first time out in a studio. Uh, earlier this year, Angeniet and, and Naomi uh, also did a, a webinar on this uh, together with the actual uh, owner of Comproved. And uh, if you're interested in that, that is part of the extent uh, of the course, extend for a part of the course. There you can find uh, the webinar recording if you want to know a lot more and a lot more ins and outs and see demonstrations. And uh, it's a nice new tool, uh, something new to try out. It's always good to have good tools that work well and uh, you get good feedback already from learners. Um, we did have um, possibly more questions coming in, so let's bounce back to Slido and see what questions we have for Anhenit. And we do have a question here, and that is, in what courses would you recommend using comparative judgment instead of rubrics? Yeah, well, any course, actually, any course in which students have to um, come up with a product, uh, writing, uh, a design, uh, code, uh, anything graphic, uh, drawings, um, anything that can be put in a, in a in a PDF file or in a video file. Um, yeah, so um, I think that answers the question. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, I have one more question. It mm -hmm. was similar to what I asked um, on link. So uh, this is going to be um, how do you help students who receive negative feedback? Mm. Um, so in online communication, somewhat like we've mentioned a little bit is the tone can be missing, there can be misunderstandings. And she kind of gave her perspective when we talked about some of the emotions and preparing, but um, how would you react to a situation? And like, how might you advise uh, students in a course? Yeah. Um, well, I often tell my students that uh, receiving feedback is a bit like receiving a present. You know, uh, someone can, you know, didn't have the time to run to the shop and, and buy a nice piece of wrapping paper that is shiny with a nice, you know, frills and things on top of it. Uh, maybe they just had an old newspaper. And so they may wrap up their message in an old newspaper that looks very crinkled and bad. Uh, but then the message can still be very much worthwhile. So I always, well, advise them to take the feedback as a present. Someone has made an effort to tell you something that maybe you can learn from. The message can be good, but the wrapping up yeah. can be not so very nice. And maybe make a distinction between those two. That's a really good yeah. point, because I do think sometimes we definitely get some bad wrappings. Definitely. But the poor <laughs> message might have been very useful, and it's sometimes missed when you stare at only the bad wrapping. Right, yeah. Um, Jillian, do you have any comments or any tips on that as well? Indeed, I think there's always something there, um, however hard it is sometimes, also for us as lecturers, like, mm. you taught that all wrong. I didn't understand any of it. We've all had that student. At the same time, I also think it's really important that not only uh, do we teach the students how to unwrap the message from the bad or the really good feedback, um, but also to also see if we can teach the student that didn't wrap it that well to make sure that they'd never well not never do it again but that they learn from that too because if you don't know if nobody bothers to tell you that you've actually given the feedback in what is um, potentially offensive or uh, un uh experiences unconstructive by the receiving party 
you're denying that student the opportunity to learn. And, and in my view, that's what we're here for. That's why we're that's why we're teaching. So so th but that's a, that's a difficult balance. And and uh, I've seen good practices done where rather than uh, focusing on the individual students, that in central sessions these uh, question uh, the, some of the feedback was highlighted as um, this is some of the feedback we've seen. Um, what will be wrong with it? How could one do different? And then let the others suggest. So in that sense, you can actually make it a learning a process. Uh, and it really helps our students. If we want our students to be the leaders of tomorrow, which to a certain extent, but what we train our students for, they also have to be able to give the message in the right way. Um, we're, doing, uh, we're selling them short if we don't teach them that skill, in my opinion. Yeah, that makes sense. And I see that we do have a question and it kind of comes off of this um, similar topic here is, if peer assessment is performed anonymous, how do you suggest we deal with potential bullying or targeted high low grading of colleagues? Yeah, yeah. In this in this um, Comprove program that we've been using, and I think in in many other peer review programs, because there are more out there, of course, uh, there's often an opportunity to flag a certain comment. So you've mm -hmm. received something that was not um, socially acceptable or too harshly formulated, or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, of course, when you are using the pro programs like this, you often have the opportunity to look behind the screen. So it is anonymous for the students. They cannot see who's been submitting what and exactly who has been giving them the peer review comments. But as teachers, of course, you can look behind the screens and know who's been doing what. So if a certain uh, remark has been flagged, so to speak, yeah. you just look it up and see, okay, is this indeed is something going wrong here? And you can have a conversation, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the student who has been, you know, bullying someone or been too harsh in their comments. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's really good to know too, that you can mm. report or you can ask basically in a different way that someone can check something like yeah. that. It's also good to know for the students, right? Yeah. That they their comments can be flagged because it, that also in that also prevents that kind of behavior. Yeah, because kind of I behavior. think if you know someone will come back and say something, you might actually be better at how you Definitely. actually write it or give that rapid yeah. right. So it's not only, you know, what you said before, like uh, when you get an emotional response, leave it for a day. Yeah. It's also when you are formulating your response, wait right. a little bit before <laughs> you push, push push that send button. Yeah, that's very true. I yeah. think it's a two-way street on yeah. that one. Um, so that's really helpful. Did you want to add to anything on that question as well? Yeah. Um, what I what I wanted to to add to it, it's always good to look at where the bullying has come from because sometimes uh, a student didn't intend to. So always investigate. Yeah. So this, it, all this is, I think, John Allen really highlighted that earlier as well. It is a sign for you to investigate. However, if you do peer grading, so where you ask students to grade each other's work, and you have a feeling that certain students are correcting other people, other students more stricter. This is where learning analytics can come in useful, and and, and also the, um, the the data analytics when you uh, look at the the uh, results. If you do the statistics, you can identify the outlier is a grader, and, and most of the the, the 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 grading software has these things. Um, you can actually assess the reliability of a grader, and then you can say, hey, this grader, do I need to do something with that? Not just from the comments, but also when they start punishing in terms of high or low grading. That's where those tools can really help you. I think I think one of the uh, advantages of our data and online tools now is is that we have better ways of flagging and and finding out. And in 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 that sense, you make use of those tools. And uh, I'm sure that will also be a part of the learning analytics module three of this e-course that is coming. Where how can you use learning analytics effectively? What can we do with this? So. Um, Again, never automatically create a grade out of this. It's always as good as both users, so that's both the lecturers and the students. And before you press the send button on the grade, make sure that you've moderated, that you've eliminated any biases. But that is what we should be doing anyway, even if it was just a paper exam. You know, we don't all grade the same. And uh, there's many different grading effects that are there that we have to take into account. So we are also only human. It's very true. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to bounce back to something that um, was said earlier about that sandwich of starting with something positive, mm -hmm. giving the critique, and then ending with something positive. So my last question <laughs> is going to be switching it on the positive side. Is, um, do you have any examples of positive experiences or benefits from peer assessments that maybe you want to share? Like what went well, mm -hmm. perhaps, and um, or maybe a, a student came back to you and said that they really liked 
the experience. So yeah, yeah, we do get that. We do get that. We could, we do get that students tell us, oh, this was more um, worthwhile than we would have thought um, yeah. in advance. And um, they will say we felt a bit reluctant to do this, but after we did it, we f- we found out that it was really nice, and and we really could take some points from this. So it also it has enforced their um, their trust in giving each other peer feedback. And also um, it has helped them to work on their skills on how to formulate this feedback in in a constructive way. It's definitely something that we need to learn. I know when I'm in front of a group of uh, fellow teachers and I'll uh, I'll ask them, uh, we'll do an exercise and I'll tell them, you can give me, you can give some feedback back now, but you can only give a positive comment. And usually I have a minute of silence because they have to think about, oh, positive only. Okay, okay, okay. And then they, you know, they mm-hmm. they 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 do have something to say there. But it's just not our natural state of being. We're used to in academics specifically to be very critical. Yeah. Um, and and that's not always a positive thing. So no, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. Cause I've heard similar things from students um mm. who I had to teach how to do the the peer feedback. And that's the first thing they said is I actually didn't know how to give positive um, or how to put it nicely in a way that they would actually receive it and do something positive. with Right. It. Yeah. So, and and so positive for... doesn't only always mean that you have to say, oh, that was nice or something like that. Exactly. It, it means that you are specific. What exactly did you find nice about this piece of writing or this presentation? Yeah. Um, and so becoming more concrete is also very much a, a challenge sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And giving concrete advice as to how to improve something so that more people can understand what you're writing or um, right. maybe yeah. you're designing or something like mm. that. So sometimes it's prefacing something because you don't know how the person got to that point. And mm-hmm. so it's just clarifying things, not necessarily critiquing it. Right. So it's yeah. nice to give that feedback. Um, I think we are uh, closer to time, but before I uh, close it off, I was just going to pass it back to uh, Gillian. Did you have anything else to um, to add for this? Um, what I'd, I'd, I'd like to say is when you make your peer assessment design, and I know many of you are working on it to find the light by this Wednesday, take into account how you will guarantee that safe space. How will you help your students get started? Uh, and don't be afraid to try. Um, Agniet and I can easily talk about this because we have made all the mistakes in the book. Don't, uh, we, we are not perfect, but we've learned from it. And by telling you all this, we're hoping to actually uh, help you, uh, prevent you making those same mistakes and have some of those painful moments that you wish you rather didn't have in your teaching career, but they exist. <laughs> so that, that's a really important part. And the other thing is do what fits you in your university, in your course, in your context with your students. Context is incredibly important because it differs from course to course and from university to university. It has to fit. What is it that you're trying to do? And this Mm -hmm. is where I'm going to refer back to the earlier comment on uh, constructive alignment. Check that it's all in alignment with what you intend to do, your learning objectives and learning outcomes, your teaching and learning activities, and your assessment activities, they all have to be in aligned and for start start doing it predominantly uh, formative. Don't immediately make it into a grade. And if you really need to do something with a grade, do something with a bonus. But, you know, take small steps, put your feet in the water, feel the temperature, see how it goes. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have to be right immediately. And it doesn't have to be perfect immediately. It, it's, an, it, it's an evolutionary process. That, that's what I would say. But please don't let it stop you from trying. Because uh, it's a very useful tool. Definitely agree on that. And we're um, running out of time. So I'll give a, a quick summary. But first, if you still have questions, you can post them in the discussion board in the course and someone will respond to you there. Um, but uh, so far, we've what we've heard today is a few different things. And I'm going to cover some of it based on the notes that I've taken so far today. Um, some of the comments that I've heard so far were, um, I know Janelyn and uh, Gillian also mentioned the group dynamics and specifically how it can affect the student work. Um, I also liked hearing about that for many of you that it was anonymous and confidential. So that makes it feel safer in a lot of ways. Um, but I also found it interesting that we bounced back to that you could still flag and report so that you can um, find things, but it's still anonymous for the students. So that's a good to know as well. Um, giving instructions is really important, but also how these assessments will be used later is really important as well. Um, and having an acceptable 
assessment, something that the students can also agree on why they're being assessed, I think is also important as part of that co-creation. Because <laughs> um, sometimes we do definitely ask them to do something and just not necessarily grade that or grade it as fully. And expectations aren't always um, fully clear. So I think that really can help. Um, pointing out that rewards can be something really important for them as far as they met the deadlines, they met the general requirements, and is that part of the grading or a rubric? Because um, if those were expectations, then they probably should be in there somewhere, which kind of makes sense, I think, too. The quality of the feedback is also important, but it's um, also dealing with the constructive alignment. Um, I also saw, what was it, that the students um, who were overlooked can also have a uh, space to shine inside of those peer assessments. Um, which was interesting as well. And it adds to the fairness of grading because sometimes it's not graded, it's just used for feedback. Um, I think that was from John Allen. But the individual versus group contribution and the efforts that are put inside of those spaces is also um, something that's um, that comes out in these peer assessments. I found it interesting because John Allen talked about rubrics and then you've talked about rubrics and then also about come proved that um, didn't use rubrics. Um, so it's kind of, an interesting perspective of whether you use them or not inside of those spaces and questioning, do you need them? And is it better to maybe not have it, but also having the visibility of those rubrics and making sure that it's very clear. Um, from Manuk, I thought something that was interesting is that the value of the peer assessments come over time. Um, and that at first it may be awkward, but then you gain experience and confidence and you have some room for that personal growth, which is really nice to hear as well. Um, looking at what you have said too about the comparative assessment, I think it is very helpful to look at what you've done in the past for self-reflection, but, but more importantly, comparing yourselves to others and the expectations that were set across so that you can see kind of that curve, like you said, but then you can see compared to your peers where you're at mm -hmm. so that you can make improvements. Um, and, um, I did find it interesting because you talked about the problems with reading and, um, that this can also be a tool with that, I think is what um, and then some sort of improvement goal of like seeing what kind of improvement can be made based on the feedback, I think it was. Um, so I think those are really great tips here. Um, but more importantly, also, no matter what, it's good to learn how to give the feedback um, and learn those techniques, because I'm sure we'll use those besides just the peer assessments. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, so those are always areas in life um, of giving and receiving the feedback, I think, is important. And I think that's probably important in any aspect of um, your career. So that's kind of something that you're preparing them for with this tool of peer assessment. Um, I think that's all I have for the summary, but I'm gonna lean to either of you if you wanted to say anything more before we do close out. I wanna thank you for hosting this for us. <laughs> you're welcome. I have. I don't have anything to add. I think uh, we covered quite a lot of things. So we did. good luck to everyone in uh, applying this in their own lectures and in their own education courses. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> great. Thank you all for being with us here today, and we hope that you've learned something for it um, this time with us. And um, good luck with the rest of the course that you're in. Thank you.